for your kind invitation to speak before you today on this uh, 19th International World Wide Web um, Conference. I want to particularly thank Paul Jones, a man whose sites have um, hosted poets and presidents. Um, he's given a home on the internet to the people of Linux and the people of Tibet. Uh, Tim O'Reilly says one of the measures of, of your, your worth in life is whether you put more into the ecosystem than you take out. And I think there's no better example of that than Paul. Before I turn to the subject of my talk, I feel I can give you a little context about how to judge these words by telling you about the first time I saw the World Wide Web in action. I was visiting Geneva in 1991 because I was interested in CERN's role as a hub for the growing net, using X25 to gateway to the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. While I was visiting CERN, the head of networking, Brian Carpenter, said I should go see one of the researchers who was doing some interesting work. I went into a dark room, and there was a young man behind his spiffy Next workstation, and he showed me his research project, which was a derivative of SGML with a little bit of local area networking thrown in. I watched Tim Berners-Lee give me a demo of his so-called World Wide Web, but I was skeptical. It looked nice, of course, but anything looked nice on a Next workstation, a high-priced hunk of hardware created by a bunch of Apple refugees. Tim showed me without a click that you could pull up a file on another computer. But I wasn't sure this was something that would ever catch on, and I distinctly remember thinking to myself, interesting, but this won't scale. <laughs> Having presented to you my credentials as a pundit, I'd like to talk to you today about some bureaucracies I've had occasion to encounter, and some lessons I've learned about how citizens with no official portfolio or status, mere citizens if you will, how citizens can change the way government works. I hope these tales are more than mere war stories. I hope to leave you today with some rules for radicals, 10 rules to apply to governing institutions as we attempt to change their behavior. We begin in ancient times, a time so long ago that the term broadband referred to ISDN lines, which would operate at a massive 64,000 bits per second the speed of a leased line, but magically switched on and off using the ISDN intelligent network. This time was the late 1980s and the early 1990s, was a time when the idea of a hyperlink was still considered the mad delusion of a wild-eyed prophet named Theodore Nelson, hence my skepticism about Tim BL's research project. In those days, there were two kinds of networks. There was a so-called internet, and there were respectable networks. The respectable networks were being defined by international institutions, such as the International Organization for Standardization and the International Telecommunication Union. These institutions were based in Geneva, and their work product was meant for grown-ups, grown-ups of sufficient means that the cost of a few thousand dollars to buy standards documents was considered not only eminently reasonable, but absolutely necessary to the functioning of our standards-making organizations. These grown-ups worked for telephone companies like AT&T and their PTT peers around the world, and for a few industrial concerns like IBM and Siemens. Asking the International Organization for Standardization, asking ISO to give away technical standards, would be as silly as asking the restaurant to give away the entrecote and the Beaujolais. In this world of many fine lunches and dinners, there was no free lunch. In those days, I couldn't afford the entrecote, certainly not the Beaujolais, I was a hack, a hack in the traditional sense of the word, making my living as a writer. A hack with a strong interest in the network, in the internet, which was a network based on open standards, a network with no kings, a network built on the then radical notion that standards should be based on decision by rough consensus and rule by working code. And while this loose-knit band of anarchists that were defining the internet based on open standards were free to ignore most of the nonsense coming out of the standards professionals and their open systems interconnection effort, there was one thing we couldn't ignore, and that was the telephone network on which we built our unreliable best effort datagram service. This telephone network was defined by the ITU in the 1988 edition of a document called The Blue Book a 19,000-page compendium that contained the standards for things like how modems worked, how to compress audio, and the operation of signaling system number seven. Anybody defining internet standards that interfaced effectively with the underlying telephone network needed the blue book. 
but I couldn't afford the blue book. It cost 2,500 Swiss francs. And since I was making a living as a columnist for the trade press, for Communications Week, and since I couldn't write about what the blue book contained, instead I wrote a lot of columns about why the blue book should be free. At the time, the secretary general of the ITU was a big Finn named Pekka Taryani, a job he got as a reward after a career in Finnish politics, followed by 12 years as the head of the Finnish PTT. Taryani had hired a lawyer named Anthony Rukowski as a counselor, and that was probably a mistake, as Tony Rukowski was in reality a double agent, an internet sympathizer who even used email. In 1991, the ITU was not exactly a technically progressive organization. They had lots of rotary dial telephones, of course, because their founding treaty specified they got free phone calls from all the PTTs, a fact they were very proud of and never ceased to point out. But there was no email and only a single fax machine for the entire 17-story building, and this telefaximile device was carefully secured in a deputy secretary general's office and required a special form with many signatures before a document was considered fax-worthy. Tony Rukowski read my columns, flaming about the ITU, and he got me a meeting with Dr. Taryani. I flew to Geneva and soon found myself in a rather spectacular secretary general suite on the top floor of the ITU tower. After a few pleasantries about Finland, reindeer, saunas, we got down to business. I stated my case. The blue book ought to be available for free on the internet. Dr. Taryani smiled the smile of a patient father and told me that in his ideal world, the Blue Book and indeed the Entrecote and maybe even the Beaujolais would all be free. But this was, of course, impossible, as much as we both might share this dream of an ideal world. You see, it really wasn't about the money, Tariani explained. There was a technical obstacle. The Blue Book was being produced on an ancient mainframe using an ancient program, a program so old they had lost the source code. And nobody was quite sure exactly how it worked. They were developing a new typesetting system, but that was several years away, and for now they were stuck with only one output device, and that was their printing press. Dr. Taryani was sure I could see while he'd love to give me the source to the blue book, it wouldn't do me any good. Even his own expert technical staff didn't quite know how this black box worked. I suggested that we could try an experiment, and this is my first rule for radicals. Call everything you do an experiment. And the experiment I proposed was that perhaps the ITU could furnish a set of tapes for the Blue Book, and the internet would try its hand at reverse engineering the system. If we succeeded, we'd give the ITU back their Blue Book in some coherent, ultra-modern format like TROF. <laughs> Since Dr. Tariani knew the internet had only a few users, none of them of serious people of means who could buy standards, he'd be able to shut up the critics by saying he had cooperated, but the internet had not been up to the task and he said we could have a set of tapes. I went to Boulder, Colorado and enlisted the help of Mike Schwartz, a professor of computer science and the creator of the original search engine, NetFind. After a few false starts, we managed to mount the tapes and read the raw data into a series of octal dumps, hundreds of pages long, which we spread on the floor next to a printed copy of the Blue Book. By comparing the octal dump to the final form, we were able to confirm that the Secretary General was correct. This system was a total mess. But after a lot of head scratching and a few surprises, we managed to turn their system into TROF and then an NROF ASCII and PostScript and posted the tarballs on an FTP server and sent a note to the IETF list. The next day, the National Science Foundation called, complaining that the Blue Book release was using up all the bandwidth on the international backbones. The cross-Atlantic line was still just an E1, running at two megabits per second and costing the NSF $60,000 per month, and we were using all the bits. I reassured the government program managers this was a temporary phenomenon, and soon we had saturated our market with files spreading out to 500 hosts in 27 countries. Then word started to trickle back to Geneva that maybe the internet was a bit bigger than previously thought. And soon after that, a Telefax simile arrived from an ITU official who explained he had been instructed by the Secretary General to convey to me a message, and that message was that our experiment was now over. The Secretary General was insisting that we remove the Blue Book from our server, and oh, while we were at it, please remove all copies of the Blue Book from the internet within 20 days. 
And I conveyed my kind regards to the Secretary General and explained that while, of course, I would comply with respect to my own server, that vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, there was not much that could be done as the proverbial cat had escaped from the proverbial bag. And this is thus my second rule for radicals, and that is when the authorities finally fire that starting gun. Do something like send you tapes. Run as fast as you can, so when they get that queasy feeling in their stomach and have second thoughts, it is too late to stop. Tariani the Finn was my first real bureaucrat, but the blue book underscored for me the importance of open standards, that if code is law, then it surely must follow that law is code, and if that is the case, then the only way that makes sense to release this code has to be open source. For the rest of my story, I turn from Geneva back to the United States. And the reason I do so is because I work in the United States and we have a lot of problems here. Um, but I do want to point out that many of these things that I'm talking about apply to other countries and in many cases they have done them much better than we have. Um, in 1993, I had graduated from print to the wonderful world of multimedia, which it meant mostly 8-bit GIF files. The blinky tag had not even been invented yet. Most of us were running network ops using FTP, email, and perhaps Gopher and Archie. And with those tools, I was running an internet radio station called Internet Talk Radio. The flagship program was Geek of the Week, which most people retrieved by launching an overnight FTP job and then, assuming the sound card was properly installed, listening to the sound file on their workstations. Not everybody had FTP. And one listener used the MCI Mail FTP gateway which broke the 30 megabyte sound files up into several hundred mail messages. When all the messages arrived, he reassembled them and curled up to his workstation for his episode of Geek of the Week. We did a lot of the future is here internet demos in those days. And after giving one in Congress, I was called aside by the staff of Congressman Edward Markey. And they showed me a letter from a Nader's raider named Jamie Love saying that the Securities and Exchange Commission database of public filings of corporations, known as EDGAR for the Electronic Data Gathering and Retrieval System, that this EDGAR database should be available on the internet for free. These EDGAR filings were used by stockbrokers, economists, analysts, and a $300 million per year industry had sprung up retailing these documents. When I was a doctoral student in economics, I learned that sometimes you could write to the corporations and ask them to send you their annual report by US mail, but often I ended up forking over $30 a document to some information retailer to read these filings electronically. To feed this $300 million a year industry, the SEC had set up a $30 million deal with Mead Data Corporation. The theory was that these filings were indigestible raw data. So Meade would act as the information wholesaler and add value to these documents, and they would sell to information retailers who would add even more value to these documents. And finally, these documents would reach the information consumer, presumably professionals on Wall Street, who knew how to read these highly technical filings full of, you know, numbers and stuff. A very brave bureaucrat named Steve Wolf at the Sci National Science Foundation, arranged for my nonprofit radio station to get a few hundred thousand dollars, enough so we could buy a feed of the Edgar data. Eric Schmidt, then the CTO at Sun Microsystems, pitched in a box with four, a box with four Spark II processors. UUNet offered free transit. Cisco threw in a router. And MFS DataNet provided a 10 megabit fiber link to the internet exchange known as May East. That 10 megabit link was fast enough that when the new Clinton administration took office, they asked to borrow it. It turns out the new tenants over at the White House were having trouble getting their routers cleared by the Secret Service. And they wanted to do a we know what the internet event is with the president. So ARPA helped us run an infrared link from the roof of the National Press Building down to the White House lawn to get them hooked up. About 90 days after the NSF grant came through, the server was up and running and raw Edgar data was on the net. Remember rule two, when the starter's pistol gets fired, run as fast as you can. We ran the service for a year and a half, starting with FTP for tarballs, then Gopher for docs, then an HTTP server, then finally a Waze database, and by mid-1995, there were 50,000 people a day using the service. 
Some of those people were financial fat cats on Wall Street, but there were also students, journalists, government employees, senior citizen investment clubs, and others that were of insufficient means to afford $30 documents. And this brings us to rule number three, which is that eyeballs rule. Build up a user base and you can have much more leverage than if you're just blowing smoke. Perhaps we should have used our first mover advantage to, as they said in the dot-com days, monetize the eyeballs, but I didn't want to be the face of the SEC. I wanted the SEC to do their job, which was to make the Edgar database available to the public on the internet for free and in an at least moderately clueful manner. So I pulled the plug. A sign appeared on the web server saying, this service will terminate in 60 days. Click here for more information. When you clicked, you got a page with source code, usage stats, cost figures, and configurations to run the system, and a series of click here links if you felt the termination of the system would somehow inconvenience you. The first click here link was click here to send mail to Newt Gingrich, the hip young speaker of the house. The next was click here to send mail to Al Gore, the hip young vice president. They both had email accounts and were very proud of them. The third click here link was click here to send mail to the chairman of the SEC. Chairman Arthur Levitt, a grand old man of finance, didn't have an email address, so we created one for him. A couple of days later, the 17,000 messages he received were printed and delivered to the SEC front desk. Coincidentally, the SEC had scheduled an Edgar Industry Day meeting, which we weren't invited to, so we crashed. After some theatrics, one of the commissioners came up and asked some simple questions, like how much would it cost to run the service and who the users were. The commissioner evidently briefed the chairman, because that evening Chairman Levitt called the Associated Press and the Wall Street Journal and said that the SEC was going to offer this Edgar database on the internet. The filings weren't a product. They were the glue that make our financial markets work efficiently by requiring corporations to disclose information to the public. The next day, the chief of staff called up and said that while he fully supported his chairman, there was one hitch, and that was that there was no way they could procure a computer in 60 days, and besides, their internet line had been installed but didn't seem to be working. Could we extend the deadline? And I said the deadline was firm. The chief of staff ended up signing a loaner agreement. We put some sunboxes in the back of a station wagon, drove down to SEC headquarters, and helped them configure their Cisco router and T1 line. They were up and running by the deadline. The computer staff ended up being tickled pink. They were running the US government's busiest web server and were getting tons of fan mail from their adoring public. Rule four is that when you achieve your objective, don't be afraid to turn on a dime and be nice. You can bang the table and be a total pain in the ass, but there comes a time to be helpful, friendly, and courteous. For the next bureaucracy, Let's fast forward this way back machine to late 2006 and early 2007. This was when Google bought YouTube for $1.65 billion. When C-SPAN started allowing you to use their video of Congress on your blog, the year Netflix started streaming videos, the year you were named Time Man of the Year, this is when video came to the internet. Well, not all the internet. Back in Washington, D.C., was an agency called the National Technical Information Service, NTIS, a government profit center tasked with, among other things, being the official retailer of video from all across the government. A look at the NTIS website showed thousands of videos from 54 different federal agencies. There was all sorts of useful stuff, none of it viewable on the internet, like training materials for volunteer firefighters from the US Fire Academy. But the prices, ooh la la, talk about champagne wishes and caviar dreams. An Ellis Island documentary, Island of Hope, Island of Tears, cost $55 for a 29-minute VHS tape. The Time of Apollo from NASA, $50 for 28 minutes. I forked over $336, ordered some tapes, and posted them to YouTube and the Internet Archive. John F. Kennedy, Years of Lightning from the U.S. Information Agency. Firefighter Safety and Survival from the U.S. Fire Academy. Day of the Killer Tornadoes from FEMA. The nice thing about the U.S. government is pretty much anything they produce is called a work of the government. And that means at the federal level, it is public domain. 
There's a couple of exceptions and some gray areas, but the basic rule is no copyright. Simple enough. You buy the video from the government and upload it and nobody can stop you. Simple that is, except for the cost. But what if we spread the pain out? What if other people bought some of these tapes and donated them to the public domain? So for $29.95 a month, I signed us up for eBay's Pro Stores, one of those anybody can build a store e-commerce solutions, and built a front-end proxy on top of the NTIS store. The deal was we'd take your money, order the tape, upload it to the Internet Archive and YouTube, and you'd get a tax deduction. In a fit of marketing, we festooned the site with slogans, be the last person to buy this fine video. Buy from us and you get nothing, but everybody gets something. And my favorite, made by the government, buy in confidence knowing the source. Okay, so it's a little cheeky and maybe even a little silly, but the whole business model was silly. With no intellectual property protection on the content, all of it works of the government, all already paid for by taxpayer dollars. If we had enough money, we'd simply buy one copy of each video and we'd be done with it. They'd be out of business. Our store was snazzy, but there were more looky-loos than buyers. In fact, we only got one order for $106, and that order was actually a mistake. The guy thought we were gonna send him a DVD. One day, I lost my patience and sent a rather intemperate fax to the director of the NTIS. A letter is probably not the appropriate characterization for this communique, and maybe flame would be more accurate. I basically accused the entire agency of falling down on the job. So imagine my surprise the next day when my phone rang and the voice on the other end said, Mr. Malamud, this is Ellen Herbst. I am director of the National Technical Information Service. And uh-oh, I thought, here it comes. Well, Ms. Um, Herbst actually turned out to be perfectly reasonable. She wanted the video out there, but by law, they were required to recover their costs. And by the time you added the people to run the service and factored in the almost non-existent sales, well, it cost $70 to sell you a videotape. If they had to recover their costs, what if it didn't cost them anything? Can you just loan us a videotape, I asked the director. You know, send us the tapes, we make a copy, we send them back to you, we'll even pay the postage. There was a long pause. Yes, I suppose we could do that. And thus was born Fedflix, where government loans us tapes which we digitize and send back to them with a DVD included for each of their videotapes. So rule five is pretty simple. Keep asking, keep rephrasing the question until they can say yes. In November 2007, a couple months after that phone call, lightning fast by government standards, we signed a joint venture agreement in which every month NTIS would send us 20 tapes. We ran that program for a year, put a couple hundred tapes online, and at the end of the year we renewed the agreement and upped the quantity to 100 tapes a month, and they started sending Betacam masters. For about $10,000, we've built up a nice little studio that does professional quality encoding of the Betacam masters, producing eight megabit H.264 MPEG-4 files. We don't do anything fancy like normalizing the sound or color correcting, but for the content we have, it just didn't seem worth it. Now, Fedflix really isn't a funded project. It's something to fill in gaps in a day. Instead of writing to a Facebook wall, a Facebook wall I choose to rip. I put an egg timer on top of the beta cam deck, pop in a tape, set the timer. When the timer goes off, I put in another tape. After a few weeks, there'll be a nice collection of files. I put together a packing list with the metadata, then use a big old hairy regex to turn the packing list into a bunch of curl calls that use the Internet Archive S3 interface and Python scripts that use the YouTube API. Perhaps the most subversive thing we do with this video is put the masters on our, FT, uh, on our server for FTP and rsync. The hardest part of making a film or a news piece today is clearing the rights in that absurd thicket of copyright obsessed stock footage libraries. With our multi-terabyte public domain stock footage library, you don't have to ask and there's never any late charges in the public domain. Sometimes amazes me what video gets popular. A World War II film called Principles of Refrigeration has received 78,000 views. It turns out there isn't any good HVAC material on the net. Our biggest hit on YouTube is a bulldozer safety film called Stay Calm and Stay in the Cab, which has over a half a million views. <laughs> One of the biggest challenges facing government is the deluge of paper, videotape, and other legacy formats. 
For agencies in the information business, such as the Library of Congress, the National Archives, and many others, the dual challenges of dealing with the legacy formats and how to face a digital future have been overwhelming. And in many cases, the agencies have turned to what they call public-private partnerships, so-called no-cost-to-the-government deals, that have proven to be especially troublesome. An example of such a no-cost-to-the-government deal was one cut by the Government Accountability Office, an arm of Congress, which has a definitive library of federal legislative history, folders for each public law that contains all the hearings, bills, and reports that led up to each statute. GAO entered into a deal with Thompson West, where the government shipped off all those federal legislative histories to the vendor, which scanned them and sent the paper back. Not that different from the FedFlix program, but with an important twist. Thompson West didn't send the GAO back digital copies of their data. Instead, Thompson West gave GAO a couple of logins for their staff to use the digitized material. But for everybody else, including government folks, including congressmen, everybody else has to pay to access the US federal legislative histories. The deal really wasn't no cost to the government since it took a huge amount of effort to pack those 60 million pages of paper up and send them to the vendor. The vendor got a sweetheart deal, an exclusive lock on a vitally important government database. The government got snookered. For my next bureaucracy, I want to talk about one of those public-private partnerships, this one being a deal the National Archives cut with Amazon. In December of 2009, I got a call from Congress asking if I could testify as part of the inaugural hearings for the new archivist, David Ferriero. As part of the research, I looked at the deal the archives had cut with Amazon. This was part of Amazon's new DVD print-on-demand service, and what they had done was digitize about 1,800 government videos, which they were making available for about $10 per DVD. Now, I've got nothing against Amazon selling DVDs, even DVDs of public domain video. But if you went to the government site, there was only a two minute preview of each video in a Microsoft proprietary format and a 320 by 240 picture. And next to that two minute preview was a government statement saying you could buy this video from our partner, Amazon.com. Rick Prellinger, creator of the Prellinger Library and the real pioneer in rescuing government video, had foiled the contract behind this arrangement, and it looked that while the National Archives got a DVD back of their video, they agreed not to post it online for five years. And there was a weird arrangement where the government got some kind of a royalty from Amazon, but the royalty was after they deducted ingestion fees for scanning the video. The government was paying for the digitization, but wasn't allowed to use the material. I asked the chief of staff of the National Archives how much these royalties they were getting were, and it turned out to be, in two years of operation of that partnership, a total of $3,273.66. This seemed nuts. So I forked over $251 and I bought 20 DVDs from Amazon and posted them in all the usual places. Some great stuff, like footage of Richard Nixon in the White House explaining why he was innocent of any wrongdoing. Then I wrote to Cory Doctorow at Boing Boing, and he posted a note telling all the happy mutants that if they watched Richard Nixon on YouTube, they could help save the public domain because we were counting all the views to show members of Congress that people really care about this stuff. Watch Richard Nixon, help save the public domain. The next day, I sent another $461 to Amazon, ordered another 28 videos, and that led to another Boing Boing post, watch the Bob Hope Christmas special and help save the public domain. <laughs> By the time I testified before Congress on December 16th, we were able to show more online views for those 48 videos than the total unit sales from the Amazon program over two years. The message was pretty clear. The Amazon deal had not brought the government any revenue, and it had come at a substantial cost of public access. We had our point as far as Congress was concerned. But when I went home, I kept looking at those 1,800 videos and wondered if there was some way to liberate them without forking over 18 grand to Amazon. I was musing about this on Twitter, and somebody at replied back and asked if I had considered an Amazon wish list, the way you let other people buy stuff for you for your bar mitzvah, birthday, baby shower, or wedding. Whoa, I thought, that's a nice hack. 
So 153 of the most impressive titles went on an Amazon wish list, and Boing Boing issued a new post suggesting that if people had an extra 1095, perhaps they could buy a Christmas gift for the public domain, tax deductible, no less. That list sold out in a matter of days, and the day before Christmas, my Amazon sent to me 43 boxes of DVDs. I spent the holidays ripping the discs, finding metadata, uploading files, and it was great. Footage of the Hindenburg blowing up. James Cagney narrating a Cold War film called The Wall. The Cambodian Royal Ballet. Old CIA propaganda films, Disney war films, early space footage, and the Roswell Area 51 investigation. Now when you criticize a government agency to their Congressional Oversight Committee, you're probably gonna get a response. So here is rule six for radicals, which is when you get the microphone, make sure you make your point clearly and succinctly. Pretty soon, I got a call from the National Archives to discuss the Amazon situation. When I said this video was totally unavailable to the public, I had misspoke. Anybody could go to the National Archives in College Park, Maryland and watch any one of those 1800 DVDs on site. They'd also let you make a copy of a DVD, and they'd even furnish the blanks to make those copies, up to six copies per visit. And they had more than the 1800 DVDs in question, they had 3000 DVDs on site. I thought about this, I said, you mean, if I went out there often enough, I could copy all 3,000 of the DVDs and post them? Absolutely, you bet, go for it. Well, at 10 minutes per DVD, that's 30,000 minutes, 500 hours, more time than I could spend in College Park, but a perfect opportunity for crowdsourcing, and thus was born the International Amateur Scanning League. I wrote to the National Archives Chief of Staff to give a courtesy heads up that I was going to draft a bunch of volunteers to go out to College Park and systematically copy all their DVDs. And imagine my surprise when she wrote back and said that David Ferriero thought this was such a great idea that he'd like to come to the initial meeting of volunteers and personally teach them how to rip DVDs. Next thing we knew, we were in a meeting room at the Sunlight Foundation in the middle of a major blizzard and the archivist of the United States was teaching us how to rip video. We printed a bunch of red, white, and blue FedFlix return envelopes for people to send the DVDs back to me as they finished. And we created public domain merit badges for volunteers who reached certain milestones. If you copy five DVDs, you get a John F. Kennedy public domain merit badge. At 25 discs, you get the Bob Hope. For 50, you get the Duke Ellington. Video is really just a hobby for me, like I said, something I do in my spare time. I run a 501c3 nonprofit, and we get our money in the form of grants from foundations such as the Omajar Network, grants from corporations such as Google and Justia. We also get contributions from private foundations such as the Elbaz, Kapoor, and O'Reilly Foundations. Foundations aren't going to give you much money if your mission statement says, we upload government videotapes. My day job, as it were, the stuff we're paid to do in the form of grants and contributions is to help change our legal system by making the law more freely available. You'll remember that with government video at the federal level, there is no copyright in works of government. That principle that there is no copyright is even more sacred for a protected core, the law. The principle that we're a nation of laws, not a nation of men, means that we write down the rules that citizens must obey. And how can we be a nation of laws if those rules are not open source? Despite this principle, access to legal materials in the United States is a $10 billion per year business. Often, government will extract, erect barriers to access as a way of extracting rent from the public. This is particularly true for a database run by the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts, a database called PACER, which stands for Public Access to Court Electronic Records. PACER contains 500 million pages of the proceedings of the U.S. District Courts, including the dockets, briefs, motions, and opinions of every U.S. federal case. The courts charge eight cents per page and require a valid credit card to access PACER. A prisoner or other citizen can petition a judge for free access, but petitioning a federal judge isn't exactly a low barrier to entry. This is big business for the courts. They drag in $120 million a year in revenue. The courts even charge the executive branch of the federal government millions of dollars a year to access these filings. 
to poke a few fingers in the eyes of the administrative office, we put up a recycling site, which let people upload their PDF documents from PACER where we'd recycle them into the public domain. Now, since PACER is a half billion page database, it was really kind of a bluff, <coughs> a vehicle for an FAQ that tried to expose the finances behind PACER. But one of the things in the FAQ caught the attention of a couple of volunteers. You see, the courts, under strong congressional pressure to do something about public access, had just launched a trial program putting one terminal in each of 17 libraries around the country. In the FAQ for the PACER recycling site, I encouraged volunteers to join the so-called thumb drive core and download docs from the public access libraries, upload them to the PACER recycling site. Aaron Swartz, many of you may know as the editor of the RSS spec and a prolific contributor to the internet, called up and said he'd like to join the thumb drive core. I told him to be careful knowing he was technically astute and inclined to script things pretty um, aggressively. I warned him to make sure he didn't violate any of the guidelines the courts had set if they said, don't download too many docs, don't download too many docs. A few weeks later, I got email saying he had some data. Could he maybe get an account to upload his docs directly? Sure, no problem. We let him SSH in. And data started to come in and come in and come in. And soon there were 760 gigabytes of Pacer docs, about 20 million pages. Aaron had evidently supersized his thumb drive, but he's a bright guy, so we weren't totally surprised. Then the stream abruptly stopped, and I got email from Aaron saying we needed to talk right away. The administrative office had evidently finally looked at their usage log after two months, and then abruptly canceled the public access program overnight saying a security breach had occurred. The superintendent of documents at the government printing office gave a speech and said not only had a security breach occurred, the FBI had been called in to investigate. Aaron and I talked again, and after grilling him, I was still convinced we had done nothing wrong. There were no signs or appropriate use statements saying this was intended for casual use only. Now, I'll grant you that 20 million pages had perhaps exceeded the expectations of the people running the pilot access project, but surprising a bureaucrat isn't illegal. From previous experience putting Court of Appeals decisions online, I was pretty sure this PACER database was going to be a mess. So rather than release the data, I started an audit looking for privacy violations. For the next two months, a series of scripts ran that looked for personal identifiers. Any files with a hit were manually examined. Many of them were false positives, such as government contract numbers or Boeing part numbers. But there were also a whole bunch of files that did have problems. And for each of those, I looked around for things the regex didn't catch, ended up finding even more social security numbers and other illegal data, like the names of minors and bank account numbers. There was the obvious stuff like the IRS suing a citizen and forgetting to redact their social security numbers on tax returns filed as evidence, or redacting the number by placing a black rectangle on top of the text, or turning the color of the text to white so it would disappear. There was also some really heart-wrenching stuff, like a list of 350 patients of a doctor who was being sued for malpractice, and for each patient, the supporting document listed their home address, their birth date, their social security number, and a list of all their medical problems. Or the list of the members of a labor union involved in pension disputes with their personal identifying information, home address, and full earnings history. After completing the analysis, we sent a formal audit over to the administrative office of the courts with a carbon copy to the judge who chairs the Judicial Conference Rules Committee. In addition to a printed list, they got a DVD that let them compare the redacted to the unredacted versions of 2,000 offending documents. Now, you'd think this was pretty shocking evidence, but the administrative office of the courts ignored the preliminary audit, then ignored the final audit, then continued to ignore us. Finally, over the Christmas holidays in 2008, letters went to the chief judges of 30 district courts. And on top of those letters, in big red type, were the words, third and final notice. The letter said, we had sent a preliminary audit to the administrative office and a final audit to the administrative office. And of course, these letters said, it goes without saying that the administrative office had promptly notified the judges of these very serious problems, since of course they didn't want to be breaking the law. 
Needless to say, the judges hadn't heard about this situation, and you have to swallow real hard before you send chief judges of U.S. District Courts letters saying third and final notice. But you know what? Judges are fairly reasonable people. They got those letters, their clerks checked them out, and we started getting letters back saying, in effect, you're right, thanks, we'll take steps. As a result of those audits, the Senate sent a strongly worded letter to the administrative office asking them why they weren't obeying the law. The judge who chairs the Rules Committee wrote back to the Senate saying that while they had privacy rules in place, they were obviously not working and they would change their rules. And a few months later, they did. Here is my seventh rule for radical, which is to get standing. One can criticize government all one wants, and they'll often ignore you. But if there is something clearly wrong and against the law, and you can document that malfeasance and wrongdoing, they have to talk to you. If you have standing, you can insist. There's a related rule, and that's rule eight, which is try to get the bureaucrats to threaten you. Remember how the law has a special place when it comes to copyright. While a state government might be able to assert copyright over some things, the Supreme Court has repeatedly ruled that, any, that nobody can copyright the law. This means no copyright on court opinions, but it also means no copyright on state statutes. So you can imagine our surprise when the Oregon Legislative Council, the lawyers for the legislature of Oregon, sent a takedown notice to public.resource.org and to Justia, a company that's been instrumental in putting free law online. The state said that by making tarballs of the 2007 Oregon revised statutes available for anonymous FTP, we had violated their copyright. Now, why would the Oregon legislature insist on copyright? Well, money. They sold a print edition, and they made money on that print edition, and we were threatening their revenue stream. Now, to be totally fair, the policy in question had been put in place in the mid-1940s, and nobody had ever questioned that policy. The takedown notice was an action of a bureaucrat just doing what they'd been doing for 70 years. Once you get a takedown notice, particularly from a body as eminent as the lawyer for the Oregon legislature, you are in legal peril. You have a right to think they're going to sue you, because that's what the takedown notice says. If you're in legal peril, you can go to a judge and ask for what's called declaratory relief, asking the court to rule on the issue. So we hired a lawyer, put together a draft declaratory relief request, and posted it on the internet. Think about a state sending you a takedown notice for putting the law on the internet, that this is not one of those subtle legal issues that you have to carefully explain to people. Everybody gets this. You can walk into any bar and explain what's going on, and everybody will instantly get the issue and say, that's really stupid. And that's my rule nine for radicals. Look for overreaching, something that's totally nuts. Not being able to publish state statutes certainly qualified on that count. A few days after we threatened to sue, we got a notice saying the Oregon legislature had scheduled hearings on this issue, and would we be prepared to testify? Well, of course, if they were willing to talk, we certainly were. We testified, as did some Oregon citizens. The lawyer for the legislature gave his testimony, and I was impressed by how well-informed and willing to look at the issues everybody was. And after a lot of questions, the Legislative Council Committee which was chaired by the President of the Senate and the Speaker of the House, voted unanimously to waive any assertions of copyright. It was democracy in action and way quicker than a lawsuit. Now to prove the point about why this was so important, a few months later, a second year law student at Lewis and Clark took the statutes and created OregonLaws.org, a dramatically better version of the Oregon statutes featuring a great UI, valid HTML, permanent URLs, an iPhone app, tag clouds, a Twitter feed, lots of bells and whistles. When a state asserts copyright over legal materials, it is important to remember that while this is partly about democracy and justice, it is also about innovation. By requiring a license as a precondition to access primary legal materials, we create a barrier to innovation. I'd like to end this tale with a bureaucracy that's a bit amorphous, a little hard to visualize, and thus an exceedingly difficult target. And that bureaucracy is all the lawyers in the United States of America. When it comes to bureaucracies, the bar truly is the Borg. The principle that access to the law must be unfettered is a basic foundation of our system of justice. The US Constitution says that equal protection under the law may not be denied. 
Equal protection means that your basic rights cannot be arbitrarily denied because you are poor or of a certain religion or race or because somebody disagrees with your political views. A poll tax, which preconditions access to the polls on access to money, is wrong because it denies equal protection under the law. I put it to you that just as a poll tax is wrong, preconditioning access to primary legal materials on having a credit card is just as wrong, and it violates our right of equal protection under the law. Turning primary legal materials from public property into private parcels violates more than equal protection. It makes due process under the law impossible when rich lawyers can do more research than poor lawyers. Now by poor lawyers, I mean public interest lawyers and solo practitioners, but I also mean government lawyers in places like the Department of Justice, who believe it or not, get memos telling them to please stop doing so much research because the department is over budget. Going back to the 1824 decision in Wheaton v. Peters, one of the landmark cases of the great Marshall Court, the Supreme Court has been clear over and over again, no copyright be they uh, court opinions or administrative regulations or state statutes or OSHA regulations or even building codes drafted by third parties but duly enacted as the law of the land. Despite this clear public policy, states and municipalities have erected a thicket of copyright restrictions, paywalls, and click-through contracts around the raw materials of our democracy. How do you change something so basic and so fundamental as access to the law? This year, people involved in the free law movement have been gathering together under the banner of law.gov, an effort to try and convince policymakers from water districts to the president and the chief justice that access to primary legal materials matters. Our strategy to get this basic principle that access to primary legal materials must be unfettered and reliable, must be available in bulk, and cannot be subject to paywalls or copyright restrictions, has started with a national conversation, a series of working groups and workshops held in many of the top law schools in the country. We're in the middle of that process right now. We just completed our workshop at, at Duke Law School Center for the Public Domain. As Paul said, we had the Archivist of the United States, we had the Deputy CTO, we had former federal judges, and eminent professors such as Professor James Boyle. We'll be completing this process of workshops and working groups in June, and then we'll issue a set of recommendations to government officials. The Ninth Circuit of the Court of Appeals has granted us time to brief the judges of the court, the U.S. Senate has asked for a copy of the report to be delivered to their attention, and I've been impressed at the number of top administration officials, members of Congress, and chief judges of the Judicial Conference who have taken a keen interest in these proceedings. In this talk, I've tried to present to you some rules for radicals, some techniques that I use in my work, but techniques that perhaps might be useful in your own efforts to change how institutions function. We've covered nine of those rules so far, and let me recap. Rule one is call everything an experiment. Rule two, when the starting gun goes off, run really fast. As a small player, the elephant can step on you, but you can outrun the elephant. Rule three is eyeballs rule. If a million people use your service, and on the internet you can do that, you've got a lot more credibility than if you're just issuing position papers and flaming the man. Rule four, when the time comes, if appropriate, be nice. Rule five, keep asking until they can say yes. Gordon Bell, the inventor of the vax, once said that you should keep your vision but modify your plan. Rule six is when you get the microphone, get to the point. Be clear about what you want. Rule seven is get standing. Have some skin in the game, some reason that you're at the table. Rule eight is get them to threaten you. Rule nine is look for overreaching, things that are just blatantly, obviously wrong or silly. And finally, we get to rule 10, which is don't be afraid to fail. It took Thomas Edison 10,000 times before he got the light bulb right. And when he was asked about those failures, he said, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Fail, fail often, and don't forget you can question authority. Thank you very much.
actually take it as a compliment on how Im important and interesting I thought your talk was. My question is, do you happen to know whether the video of this talk will be available freely online? <laughs> I, I don't know if, I, I, I think that the video will be available and I've been told by the conference organizers they'll send me a copy, so. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thanks a lot. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Yeah.